proximal tibial shaft fractures. This video has been produced from a book source. I would like thank editor of the book, Peter V. Gianudis and chapter authors, Mauricio Cafuri and William Diaz, Belangero. The tibia is the second largest long bone of the skeleton. It has a triangular shape with an anteriorly oriented apex. The anteromedial surface of the tibia is concave and has no muscle coverage. The proximal end of the tibia has unique anatomical characteristics due to its soft tissue attachments. On its anteromedial side, the medial collateral ligament and the attachment of the pes and serinus are the most relevant soft tissue structures. Anteriorly, the tibial tuberosity is a bony prominence to which the patella ligament attaches. The muscles of the anterior compartment of the leg, the deep perineal nerve, and the anterior tibialis vessels are located on the projection of the anterolateral surface of the tibia. In the posterior aspect of the proximal tibia, the popliteal vessels lay over the popliteus muscle then, entering the soleus fibrous arch to immediately divide into anterior and posterior tibialis vessels. Extra-articular proximal tibial fractures may be associated with compartment syndrome and neurovascular injury. Fractures located immediately below the insertion of the patella ligament may have typical hyperextension deformity of the tibial epiphysis due to pulling forces applied by the quadriceps muscle. Patient set up in theater. A radiolucent table is recommended for the surgical treatment of proximal tibial shaft fractures. Patient is normally placed supine on the operative table. As there is a normal trend to external rotation of the lower limb, a small pillow or foam is applied under the ipsilateral hip, lifting it up. If an external fixator or a plate will be used, a foam ramp is applied under the lower extremity allowing for the elevation of this leg in comparison with the contralateral one. The goal of this elevation is to allow for the use of fluoroscopy in multiple projections without the interference of the opposite leg. C. Once the leg positioning is approved, the foam is fixed to the table with bandages. We also assure that the opposite leg is properly protected with cushion clothes and immobilized to the table with supportive devices, avoiding its unintentional mobilization during the surgical procedure. Next, the leg is prepped and draped in a sterile manner with the drapes covering the ramp and the opposite leg. If the option is for an intramedullary fixation, with an infrapatellar approach, no ramp is used under the leg, and the positioning of the patient should allow for complete range of the motion of the knee. To assure the access to the entry point of the nail in the tibia, in case of infrapatellar insertion of the nail, the knee has to be flexed up to 120 degrees, at least. To maintain the knee bent, we normally use radiolucent triangles which are sterile and applied under the lower extremity, figure D. Patient set up in the operation theater. A patient is placed supine on a radiolucent table for surgical treatment. B. With a small bump, foam pillow, under the buttock, it is possible to control the trend towards external rotation of the leg. C. To assure good visualization with fluoroscopy, the leg to be operated is kept higher than the opposite leg. A foam ramp is used to secure that the leg is positioned properly for the surgical procedure. D. Alternatively, in cases where an intramedullary nail fixation is selected, the use of radiolucent triangle allows for proper bending of the knee. With the knee in flexion, the access to the superior aspect of the tibia is facilitated. Surgical fixation of the proximal tibia requires the intraoperative use of fluoroscopy for the assurance of fracture reduction and proper hardware placement. Closed reduction maneuvers. Fractures of the upper third of the tibia have three major vector forces causing displacement, the quadriceps muscle, which pulls the epiphyseal segment proximally and in extension, the tendons of the pes anserine which pull the epiphyseal fragment medially, and the gastrocnemius muscles, 
which pull the distal tibial fragment posteriorly. As a result, the typical finding is an angulation of the fracture site with apex anterior and valgus. The more one bends the knee, the higher the displacement of the fracture. The application of traction with a large bone distractor, keeping the knee in extension, seems to be a very elegant maneuver to restore length and alignment in a closed manner. The pins of the distractor should be applied to the side of the concavity of the deformity, as this is the shorter one. In case of a valgus displacement of the fracture, for example, one chance pin is applied either in the anterolateral aspect of the proximal tibia or in the anterolateral aspect of the distal femur, while another chance pin is inserted in the anterolateral aspect of the distal fragment of the fracture, making sure that soft tissues are protected avoiding risks of damage to th branches of the perineal nerve. The femoral distractor may also be used in association with intramedullary nail techniques. In this situation, the proximal chance pin is inserted in the posteromedial corner of the tibia, posterior to the normal path of the nail. The distal pin is inserted in the most distal aspect of the tibia, to avoid interference with reaming or insertion of the intramedullary nail. The successful use of the intramedullary nails for the treatment of proximal tibial fractures requires the understanding that due to the widening of the medullary canal in the proximal fragment, the nail may easily be inserted through the proximal fragment reaching the distal fragment even if the fracture is not reduced. Several strategies have been described to overcome the trend to malalignment along the intramedullary fixation of proximal tibia fractures. The use of screws to block the intramedullary canal, making it narrower and allowing for the reduction of the fracture during the insertion of the rod in the tibia is one of the most elegant techniques for closed reduction of proximal tibial fractures. In cases of angular deformities, the screw is inserted on the side of the concavity of the deformity. Typically, in the proximal tibia, the screw is placed from medial to lateral on the posterior aspect of the proximal fragment to avoid the anterior angulation of the proximal fragment. In cases the proximal fragment has a trend towards valgus angulation, a screw is inserted from anterior to posterior on the lateral side of the wide fragment. In cases of angular deformities, the screw is inserted on the side of the concavity of the deformity. Typically, in the proximal tibia, the screw is placed from medial to lateral on the posterior aspect of the proximal fragment to avoid the anterior angulation of the proximal fragment. In cases the proximal fragment has a trend towards valgus angulation, a screw is inserted from anterior to posterior on the lateral side of the wide fragment. The effect of a polar screw, a typical deformity with apex anterior of the proximal fragment of a proximal tibial fracture, b, outcomes after implantation of an intramedullary nail, revealing residual deformity in procurvatum, as the nail cannot control the proximal fragment, due to the width of the medullary canal, c, the use of a polar screw inserted from medial to lateral on the posterior aspect of the medullary canal blocks partially the canal and makes it narrower favoring a better control of the proximal tibial alignment, d, Final outcomes after the insertion of the intramedullary nail in combination with a polar screw applied on the side of the concavity of the deformity, depicting satisfactory reduction of the proximal tibia. A suprapatellar entry point for an intramedullary tibial nail may be beneficial in cases of proximal tibial fractures because with this technique, hyperflexion of the knee is not needed for the insertion of the nail. Therefore, it is easier to Maintain the reduction of the proximal tibial while opening and reaming the medullary canal. Another method of closed reduction has been described recently as the clothesline technique. Two Steinman pins are inserted through the tibial fragments from medial to lateral, being one proximal and the other distal to the fracture. The pins should be parallel, respectively, to the knee and the ankle joints and should also be in the same frontal plane to avoid rotational deformity. 
The pins are then connected to external fixator bars to configure a square. With the square in place, it is possible to apply longitudinal traction and adjust for valgus and varus reduction, as well as for translation of the fragments. Next, a hole is made on the anterior cortex of the tibia with a 2.0 mm drill bit. A circlage wire is applied through the hole and around the external fixator bars. At the time when the wire is tensioned, the extension deformity of the proximal segment of the tibia is reduced, and at this point, the knee may be bent as much as needed without secondary loss of reduction, allowing for the insertion of a tibial intramedullary nail. At the time when the wire is tensioned, the extension deformity of the proximal segment of the tibia is reduced, and at this point, the knee may be bent as much as needed without secondary loss of reduction, allowing for the insertion of a tibial intramedullary nail. Indirect reduction with a clothesline technique. A illustration of a segmental tibial shaft fracture with typical displacement of the proximal fragment. B. The application of an external fixator frame consisting of two bars parallel to the tibial shaft and two Steinman pins transfixing the tibia from medial to lateral, being one pin proximal and one pin distal. The frame has a square configuration. The length of the tibia is obtained by manual traction, and the external fixator frame connector is tightened. The circlage wire is passed through the apex of the proximal tibial fragment and around the two external fixator bars. C. When one tightens the circlage wire, it pulls the epiphyseal fragment backwards. D. With the frame in place and no blockage of the intramedullary canal, one may insert the tibial nail for definitive fixation of the tibia 25 proximal tibial shaft fractures. Figure, clinical application of the clothesline technique, A, B. Anteroposterior and lateral projections of the proximal tibia illustrating a displaced fracture, C, application of the external fixator frame. Observe that the proximal Steinman pin is bent due to the traction used to reduce the fracture. D. The lateral radiograph shows that, even after the nail is inserted, there is displacement of the proximal tibial fragment in anticurvation. E. Two wires are applied to the tibia, and tension is applied to them by wrapping them around the bars of the external fixator. F. The fracture is completely reduced on the lateral projection of the fluoroscopy. G. Now, with the nail in place, Fracture looks perfectly reduced. H. Postoperative radiographic control shows satisfactory reduction of the tibia. Thanks for watching. Subscribe.